The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. Let's start from 2 Timothy chapter 2, from verse 1 to 8. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through to 8. You then, my son, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying. For the Lord will give you insight into all this. Now my interest is in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. But I like the NLT, New Living Translation rendering of verse 8. It says that always remember that Jesus Christ a descendant of King David was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. Now, the apostle Paul here was trying to tell his son, Timothy, the pastor of the church in Ephesus, whom he was encouraging to war as a good soldier of Christ. And to come out of timidity and then brace himself to do battle for the law, stand as a good soldier, and then pass on the good deposit to other people who can also pass it on. Then he said this Remember, Timothy, that Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, was raised from the dead. This is the gospel I, Paul, preach, and this is the gospel we preach. Jesus Christ, the descendant of David, was raised from the dead. Always remember. What is he trying to say? He is trying to convey to him that the knowledge of the fact of the resurrection is the foundation of ministry. It is the sustainer of ministry. It is the cause of effective ministry. The knowledge of the fact of the resurrection of Christ is the anchor of the believer. It is the gospel we preach. Take it out and Christianity has no value. It is so easy to preach on, a, on an Easter day because in Easter, every verse in the Bible can be preached. It's a bit difficult trying to find a message on a Christmas day. If you don't take care on a Christmas day, you still preach an Easter message. And all our messages are Easter. But on a day like this, it is very easy to preach. You can take from Nebuchadnezzar and you can have a message. 
Everyone will give you a message. Take from Satan himself, even words that Satan has spoken, and you can preach an Easter message. That is the reason of who we are. It defines us. It is the resurrection of Christ that makes the difference between Jesus and Buddha. It brings the difference between Jesus Christ and Confucius. It is the reason for the vast difference between Christ Jesus and Muhammad. You can't compare. Jesus is not a theory. He is a life-giving spirit. When we are talking about the resurrection, we are not talking about sound and light. As some religions who want to give us some theories, hypotheses, some propositions, light and sound. For what? We are talking about a descendant of David. Something real. Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, was raised from the dead. This is the message we preach. His resurrection makes Christianity an exclusive religion. Don't compare us to any other. Even though our Jesus is for all, Christianity is an exclusive religion. We don't believe in a cause. We believe in a person. Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, was raised from the dead. To those of us who are born again, always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, was raised from the dead. God raised him from the dead because the Bible says that it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. It was just impossible. They tried to kill him. He was buried, but Jesus was raised from the dead. And that fact is very important. I will go into that and just to bring out some of the importance of the resurrection of Christ. Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, was raised from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. I'll read a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians 15. You can go back to the NIV, please. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you receive and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. The gospel he preached is Jesus Christ who has been resurrected. And the Bible says that Paul is saying to his, his, his audience that by this gospel you are saved. You don't need any other. There is no other argument. You don't need anointing oil. You don't need further water. You don't need anything extra. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for us. It is enough. If you hold on to it, you are saved. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first important, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. We preach that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures, but the Bible says he was raised. Now, if you take the resurrection out, verse 12 says this, it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. 
For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ has not been raised, we wouldn't have a message to preach. And our faith has no anchor, no foundation. And our preaching is useless. But Christ has been raised from the dead. And we don't want our preaching to be useless. We don't want to think that we have believed for nothing. That is why Paul is telling his son Timothy, always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, was raised from the dead. Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, was raised from the dead. What is all this resurrection about? How important is it? I've read one scripture to you. That is the gospel we preach. If there's no resurrection, there is no Christianity. Christianity is just meaningless. According to Paul, then our preaching has no value. But Christ has been raised from the dead. Hmm. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11. We read from verse 1 to 5. And then we jump to 10 to 11. What is the importance of the resurrection? What is the significance of the resurrection? And connecting Jesus to David. Why should we always remember why? Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse. From the roots, a branch will bear fruit. New Living Translation says, Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. A new branch will bear fruit from the old root of the stump of David. What is he trying to say? He is trying to say that a new branch from the old root simply means that, you see, by the time of the exile, David's royal family was effectively scrapped. It was nowhere to be found. It was almost dead. It ceased. But a new branch will spring up from the dead root of David. Who is he? The Bible says that he had a name that no one knew. His name was the word of God. And the Bible describes him as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Jesus Christ from the root of David. David is not dead because of Jesus. From the root of David comes a new shoot, a fresh one to continue the lineage of David. Jesus Christ. A shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse. From the root, a branch will bear fruit. Matthew chapter 1, from verse 1. Matthew 1, from 1, says that this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of who? The son of David. The son of Abraham. So from the roots, the stem that was cut, from the root of Jesse, from the root of David, a new branch will shoot. A new branch will shoot. Now let's jump to verse 17 of chapter 1 of Matthew. Thus, there were 14 generations of all from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile to Babylon. And 14 from exile to Messiah, the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, 
an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of who? David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. We are trying to look at the root of David. A new shoot will spring. A new shoot will spring. The verse 2 of Isaiah 11 says this. Verse 2 of Isaiah 11. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It says that from the root of Jesse, there will be a new shoot. And then we are tracing that Jesus Christ came from the root of David. If you take his mother's side, David. If you take even Joseph's side, he is still connected to David. And the Bible said that shoot, the spirit of the Lord will be upon him. Is it still Jesus? Can you qualify for these two descriptions? Luke chapter 4. Can you qualify for this one too? Luke chapter 4 from verse 17. Luke 4, 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me. What is on him? The spirit of the Lord. He says that the spirit of the Lord will be upon him. The spirit of wisdom, of counsel, of knowledge. It doesn't mean that these are categories of spirits. No. Sometimes people read Isaiah chapter 1. And then when they get to verse 2, they want to make something out of it. Let's go so that I will show you what they make out of it. Isaiah chapter 11 again. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. That is okay. The dash simply means that he is trying to open it up. It doesn't mean that the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. So one, another spirit, the spirit of wisdom. Another spirit, the spirit of understanding. Another spirit, the spirit of counsel. Another spirit, the spirit of might. Another spirit, the spirit of knowledge. Another spirit, the spirit of the fear of God. It says seven spirits of God. Not any seven spirits of God. He's just trying to explain what the spirit of God does. He's just trying to describe. It's not the seven spirits of God does not have seven spirits. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. But he says that the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. When he entered the synagogue... For the first time, they gave him the scroll to read. And he opened the place that concerns him. That is what the scripture says. And this is what he's going to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because Isaiah said, Out of the root of Jesse will come a branch. His from David, we have phrased that. And he says that the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him. And he says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. Peter said, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So we are talking about Jesus raised from the dead. Raised from the dead. Now, verse 3 of Isaiah 11. Verse 3 of Isaiah 11, please. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. Or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decision for the poor on the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of the mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the shafts around his waist. But let's jump to 
verse 10, 11, and 12. Isaiah chapter 11. And this is very important. Verse 10 comes back to the root of Jesse again. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. And here he said there is going to come a time where the root of Jesse, Jesus Christ, will be the banner of the peoples, will be the celebration of the peoples, will be the desire of the nations. Jesus will be the desire of the nations. We'll come back to that one too. Will be the banner of the peoples, a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. Hallelujah. Now, this is the big one. Verse 11. I wish we can read together. Okay, let's take verse 11 together. Ready, go. In that day, the, a second time, to reclaim the surviving remnants of the people from Assyria, from the lower age, from upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from island of the Mad now let's read just the first part in that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving of the remnants of the people now listen he's saying that when the desire of the people come after him the root of Jesse, Jesus Christ that day When their desire have come upon him, God will stretch forth his hand the second time. Now, Isaiah is trying to tell us that he has stretched forth his hands once and he's going to do it the second time. And this second time, he's going to rope in the rest. When was the first time? Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. The Lord will stretch forth his hand the second time. The purpose is to gather the nations to himself. The first time was in Exodus chapter 3. We'll read to, from verse 16, Exodus 3, 16. Now, this is God to Moses. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you. I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you... And the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifice to the Lord our God. Let's read together. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. God was going to stretch a mighty hand in Egypt. Isaiah says that he has done it before. He has done it before. Unless a mighty hand compares him, so I will stretch out my hand, not Moses' hand, the one who is speaking's hand, God's hand. I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And... I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people. And so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. It did happen. It did happen. It did happen. 
one morning, this is what the Bible says. The Israelites did just, just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. Verse 28. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my, my people, you and the Israelites, go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flock, your hands, as you have said, and go, and also bless me. <laughs> if, if you have any, so, eh? yeah. and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, we will all die. That is God. He began from Pharaoh's house. He did justice to all their gods. And he gave Pharaoh a technical knockout. So now you can go. You can go. Go, live here. Otherwise, all of us will die. And according to Paul, when they were crossing the Red Sea, Paul says that it was a baptism. They were all baptized in the Red Sea. So God stretched forth his hand, but delivered only one nation out of the lot. Even though the whole world is his. So let's go back to Isaiah 11 verse 11. Isaiah 11 verse 11. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush. If you don't know, this one is black Africans. From Ethiopia, from Africa. Now, you see, all these people that God chose Israel out of, they are all descendants of Noah because the flood destroyed the whole earth. Noah and his people, his household were in the ark. After the flood, it was Noah and the household that God has so pleased. They filled the earth. So if you hear someone call a Jebusite, a Hittite, a Canaanite, a Hortite, or a Ghanaian, American, all of us came from the ark. All of us. So everyone on the planet Earth belongs to God. He created us. But the first time he stretched his hand, he took a nation. But Isaiah says that he will do it the second time. And robe in the rest. Hallelujah. He will robe in the rest. Why? Because verse 10 says that in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be so glorious. When he was born, when he was on the planet Earth, because of who he was and what he was doing, people followed him. Crowd followed him. Let's examine what happened in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I read from verse 17. John 12 from 17. Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. They continued to do what? Spread the word. Now Lazarus was raised. In fact, Lazarus was sick, a friend of Jesus. And then when the report came to him that your friend, the one you love, is sick, 
The Bible said that Jesus Christ intentionally tarried. And so that Lazarus would die. After four days, he decided to go to Bethany. And then on his way to Bethany, Mary and Martha met him and said, if you had come earlier, your friend wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, no, don't worry. This is a strategic dying. This one is for a purpose. It's for the glory of God. No one has ever heard that someone has died. At least a Jew has died and has been raised on the fourth day. Because the theory is that by the fourth day, you should be rotten. So leave him, let him die. I will come on the fourth day. Just for the glory of God. To teach a lesson on the planet earth that one day we will rise. And you see, coming out of the grave is not going to be difficult. It's not going to be difficult. You see, he only has to shout. The Bible says that the trumpets will sound and Jesus will shout. When he shouted, it is finished. Graves opened. And the Bible says many dead were seen in Jerusalem. But this one, when he got to the grave of Lazarus, he wanted only Lazarus to come out. So he didn't just shout. Say, Lazarus! And the Bible says he shouted and called his name. And he that was dead came out as though he was not dead. By that performance, his fame spread. And everyone wanted to see him. Let's go back to John again, where we were reading. Everyone wanted to see him, 12, 17. Now, the crowd that was with him when he had called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. What can they do? They have to spread it. They, they have not heard it such a thing before. So they spread the word. They spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now, compare this to Isaiah 11 verse 10. Let's go back to Isaiah 11 verse 10. Whether the scripture concerns Jesus or someone else. Look at verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, Jesus will stand as a banner of the peoples. The nations will rally to him. Now, this is the Pharisees, the very enemies of Christ. They have tried to stop him. They saw him as developing a new set, and they didn't like him. But by the resurrection, or let me say, by the raising of Lazarus from the dead, so that will be theologically correct. Everyone was following you, and the people said, you see, what we are doing is getting nowhere. Everyone is going after him. And Isaiah says that the nations will rally after him. And then when they come rallying after him, it is there and then that God will stretch forth his hand the second time. God will stretch forth his hand the second time. Let's go back to John 12. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world, the whole who? The whole world. How the whole world has gone after him. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. These are Gentiles. They came to Philip whose name was a Gentile name, a Greek name, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, 
with a request, say, they said, we would like to see Jesus. We also want to see him. Because the whole world is after him. But when Jesus sent the disciples to go and preach, he was emphatic. Don't go to the Gentiles. Because the Bible said they will come to him. <laughs> so don't go to the Gentiles. You leave them. They will come to me. 